there's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart Sunday morning hallelujah and it's lasting all week long let me hear you come on can you feel it can you feel it it's a rhythm of a gospel song oh what you choose it you can't lose it yeah cause there ain't nothing there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy i've got an old church choir singing in my soul i got a sweet salvation in this beautiful i got a heart overflowing because i've been restored there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy no there ain't nothing gonna steal Come on. my joy when the valleys that I wander turn to mountains I can't climb. Oh, you are with me, never leave me here. Cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation in this beautiful. I got a heart. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel because it's all you ever need. All you ever need. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel because it's all you ever need. All you ever need. Yeah. I got no church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation. Come on, church. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation. It's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah.
Good morning and welcome. We are so thankful that you are here today. I take it by you being here, you did it. You remembered to set back your clocks. Or if you're like me and you're 100% reliant on your phone doing it for you. Uh, thank God for the phones and uh, that's why I'm here on time. Those of you watching online because you just woke up, welcome. We're glad you're here too. I love, I love this place. This place to me is, is more than a building. It's more than a church. It's a place where we can gather. It's a place where we can freely worship our King. And so that's what we're going to continue to do. So as you continue to stand, let's, let's worship together. Church, just remember these altars are open no matter what point of the service we're at. If you feel the need to come down and pray at these altars, someone will come down and pray with you.
is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. chaotic and um, when I talk about chaos I think about that I have we, we all have chaos in our lives we have chaos in our homes um, but we also see it on a national level on a global level and when I start seeing um, others that are hurting around me and I, and I know what's going on in their lives I, I, I really start questioning and thinking about why things happen and what's going to happen and I have to remind myself that there's only one constant in this world and in this life and that's that's God and I know chaos can creep in, and it, it lets the enemy in, and it lets, it, it lets him try to steal our joy and our peace. And we have to be open to remembering that God is that constant, and we have to let him into our lives. So this morning, let's sing, and let's welcome him into our, into our worship and into this, yes. this church this morning. Sweetest love. 
may be seated. Good morning and welcome. I just have uh, one, one thing I want to get into before we uh, get into the sermon, and that is in your worship folder, you should have a little card that looks like this. This is given to you as an invite, a way for you to invite somebody to church. An easier way to do that, to hand them and say, hey, we'd love for you to come and join our new Easter series. We are getting into a series here on March 27th that will lead us through Easter. I'm really excited about it, called Awakened. And we're going to be looking, at, uh, uh, looking through some of the resurrections that happened in the New Testament and what it means for us to live a new and awakened life. I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited about it. As we get started, would you pray with me? 
Father God, thank you so much uh, just for your love and for your truth and all that you are. Lord, I am so aware that anything that I might or could say is just not good enough. Lord, I believe that through your spirit you have and can speak words of truth to our hearts this morning. So I ask that you'd help me to step aside, that you would fill me with your spirit, that you would use your word to bring to life in us your way and your purpose and your mission. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Gather with us here in this time. In your holy name we pray. Amen. My name is Pastor Will Hebner. I am the senior pastor here at Vincent's First Church of God. We are continuing a series this morning that we've been in for a while called Church Identity. We've kind of been looking into the, the why and the what behind church. Why do we gather? Why do we do what we do? For what purpose are we here? One of the things that we aspire to as a church is evangelism. And today that's what our focus is going to be on. But what, what is that? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Evangelism, by definition, is a zealous advocacy of a cause. But in our case, that zealousness comes for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And it matters because <laughs> apart from Jesus, there is only death. So for me, evangelism, simply put, is to care about the lost, to care about people that they might find new life in Christ, to care that we have brothers and sisters and co-workers and friends and neighbors who might be headed towards hell. With that in mind, I had to ask myself the question, why don't we care more about the lost? I realize that Maybe we don't necessarily feel that way and we would never say that, but sometimes we communicate that through our actions. And I thought, I thought it might be helpful to go through some of those. So if you have your outline and you want to fill in some blanks, I've even thrown some in that aren't even there just for fun, just to throw you off. What are some of the ways that we communicate complacency towards the loss? Here's the first one. The first one is easy. This is busyness. And busyness just becomes, it comes from selfishness. Everything that I need to do is more important. We don't leave enough margin in our lives uh, to, to care, to have compassion for the loss. It's not necessarily that we don't care. We just don't leave enough room in our lives to even think about it. The next piece is lack of urgency. We forget that tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So we end up waiting for opportunities to come to us rather than seeking out those opportunities. And I think it is Satan who wants us to think that we have all the time in the world. We don't. This uh, this can also be fueled by universalism. And that is this idea, well, we're all going to heaven anyways. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Next one is lack of intentionality. I love this quote from Zig Ziglar. He says this, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Evangelism is like farming. If you plant no seeds, nothing will grow. So how do we set evangelistic goals in our lives? How often do we pray and seek for those opportunities to share our faith? Another one is bias networking. And this is probably the the biggest one for me. We tend to surround ourselves with people that look, act, and think just like us. And I am so guilty of being sucked in and living in a a Christian bubble where I don't even really have anyone to witness to because I don't have non-Christian friends. But we are called to be in the world, but not of it. But often we fall prey to the opposite. We are of the world and not in it. Another thing that happens is a word, it's a big word for me, I had to look it up, vilification. And this is the Jonah mentality. It is these people don't deserve God's grace. It can become really easy for us to paint our brothers and sisters in Christ, the enemy, making us not feel bad about missing opportunities or not witnessing with them altogether. Or we just simply paint them as hopeless. Like, it doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're too far gone. That nothing can help them. There's a parable in Scripture of, about a farmer who, who sows seed everywhere. And and, and it's really interesting to me that if you're a farmer, I'm hoping that you know the difference between good and bad soil. 
So I, I felt like Jesus is saying to me, listen, it is not your job to decide what is good and bad soil. It's your job to sow seeds. It's your job to water those seeds. And you let me worry about whether or not it's going to grow. This leads to another piece that I didn't write in that I thought of earlier that I just think is, is huge. And that is discouragement. And that is the giving in to hopelessness, which causes us to, to give up or, or to lose our enthusiasm to, to reach out to others. Often because maybe sometimes we don't feel like we're making a difference or maybe nothing is changing. We find ourselves trying to control and, and speed up someone else's narrative. Believe in Jesus! And we find ourselves frustrated with the results because guess what? We can't save them. It's God who saves this leads me to ask the question, if Jesus is the one who saves, then what's my job? What, what does it look like to care about the lost? What, what, in all of this, where is my responsibility? 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7 says this, I planted, but Apollos watered. But it is God who gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God is the one who gives growth. I've seen this in, in my own life. I had a really, really good friend that lived just across the street, and he didn't grow up in a Christian home like me and a couple of our other neighborhood buddies did. And so I remember having those little conversations as we play in the pool and as we'd sit and play Mario Kart and, and Goldeneye on N64, well, and memories, wow. And we'd do that, and, and we'd have some of those conversations, and, and we'd, we'd talk about Jesus with him, and and I don't know that I ever felt like it really made a difference. And I remember when I got to college, I, I, I had this little prayer journal, and I just prayed for the lost on every, like, Thursday. And he was one of those names. And I remember him reaching out to me later in life and said, Hey, man, I just want to let you know I ended up giving my life to Christ. It had nothing to do with me, right? But, but I got to be a part of his journey. I was a seed that was planted. I was water that gave nourishment. But it is God that grew. And I think that we understand this, that the truth of this scripture that we read, because it comes with its own concrete illustration. You can plant seeds and, and you can water them, but you, you cannot cause a plant to grow. This means that you can provide the right environment for growth, but you can't actually make it grow. And I'm surprised that I didn't hear uh, any more amens uh, from you guys because some of y'all in this room can't even keep plants alive. <laughs> not, not naming any names or looking at anybody in particular. <laughs> and I'm sorry for this, this, this cheesy pun, but I, I hope it'll help you understand this. Growth can only come from exposure to the sun. S-O-N. This is great news because that means that the pressure of evangelism, it doesn't rest solely on us. It's our responsibility to simply plant and water seeds. So how do we do that? Well, how do we plant and, and water seeds? First off, I think that the heart matters. And this, this first point isn't necessarily how, but I, I think it's so important for us to understand this. Focus on building up God's kingdom, not the church. Focus on building up God's kingdom, not the church. Guys, we are not trying to grow a church. We are trying to grow the kingdom of God. This means that our focus isn't on numbers in the pews, but souls in heaven. That takes the focus off of what benefits us because it's not about us. This is part of the reason why the Church of God movement, the church that, that you belong here, we, we decided not to put too much emphasis or focus on membership but th this whole idea of placing a bigger focus and emphasis on God's kingdom, not on our churches. I want to read Matthew 4, 18 and 19. It says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I love this, I love this verse, and, and I love the transition that, that Jesus is making with them. He says, listen, you used to be fishers of fish. Now I want you to be fishers of men. This, this transition between caring about what you can, you can gain or help people or sell or do whatever, now I'm going to transition you to an eternal mindset. 
I don't want you to make an earthly impact. I want you to make one in heaven. This idea that, that evangelism is all about Jesus, it's, it's not about growing a following. We're not trying to replicate ourselves. We're not trying to replicate the way we think, the way we believe. But instead, we're trying to help others fall in love with Jesus, not the church. I don't know about you, I, I went couch shopping yesterday. And, and there, man, there can be nothing more annoying than a salesman. Okay? Sometimes I hate going to the furniture stores just because I don't want to deal with the salesman. It's like, listen, dude, I'm just going to sit on some couches and I will let you know when I need some help. Okay, I took, I took Malin with me because she's the ultimate couch tester. And I'm pretty sure she jumped on every couch in the store. <laughs> but you guys understand this. There, there is a right and a wrong way to do sales. And, and this is just my opinion, but I want a salesman who cares more about helping me find something that's going to benefit me versus him just trying to make commission. Tell me how you've invested and tell me how the product has helped you. Like, if you don't own this couch, I don't want you to talk to me about it. Because if you haven't invested it and it's not in your house, then I don't want to hear about it. You can't tell me about the longevity of this couch. This, this is the heart of evangelism. We're not trying to win people over. We're trying to point people to Jesus Christ. We're not trying to earn favor with God. We're just trying to share how he's changed our lives. That's the heart. Let me, let me go into a couple of ways of, in which we can do this. First is this. Let your companionship inspire faith. Let your companionship inspire faith. I don't know if I'm the only one in here. Did anybody else grow up watching the Elevator to Hell video? Can I get a raise of hands? Anybody else watch that? Am I the only one? Maybe that was a Florida thing. We're closer to the sun, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> I say that to say that in the past, sometimes the church has been bad about using fear tactics for evangelism. And, and I get the stress and, and urgency of it, but sometimes we, we focus on the negative. Think about why you believe today. You probably don't believe in Jesus because of fear. I'm assuming that more likely you, you believe because in some way you've experienced God's love in your life. And probably more likely that you've experienced that love through another believer. This means that we have to change our tactics to look more like Jesus. And look at how Jesus approached evangelism. He left the comfort of heaven to come here to earth, to be near us. Look at the way he dealt with people. Look at the way he dealt with the lost. Look at how he, he gave hard truths, but he was always gentle with them. I want to read to you Matthew 10, 16 through 18. It says this, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them among the Gentiles. God is sending us. He is, he is calling us to be wise as serpents, but also to be harmless as doves. That in the midst of wolves, that, that we might witness before all people to, to be honest and to be gentle at the same time. This is how we communicate the truth in love. Yes, you're going to hell, but there is a way. We have a Savior who's made a way. There's a story in Scripture of the, the rich young ruler, and I love how Jesus interacts with this man. This man comes to him and says, Jesus, how can I get to heaven? And Jesus says, well, have you followed these commandments? He only mentions some of them. There's some commandments that he leaves out. And, and the guy says, well, I've followed those since my birth. And then Jesus says, well, all you have to do is, is sell all you possess and follow me. What he does is instead of taking those four or five commandments that he doesn't mention, which he's probably not following, he doesn't throw that in his face. He says, look, you've done a good job following these, but now here's your opportunity to get the rest of it right. Scripture says that he looked at him in love and said, follow me. And Jesus offers him, he invites him to be a part of his life, an invitation to follow him. 
How might we follow suit? How might we do the same to invite the people in our life to, to not just follow us, but to follow who we're following? You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about sharing our testimonies, this piece of discipleship. And I think evangelism takes that just one step further, and that is to live out our testimonies. And here's a few ways that we can live out our testimonies. One, we've got to learn to live honestly with our brokenness. Now, this doesn't mean putting all your dirty secrets on blast, but it simply means that we get real about our weakness and we don't try to pretend that we have it all together because guess what? We don't. And, and when you hide your brokenness, all you're doing is, is you're preventing yourself from finding healing. And then you prevent others from seeing the restorative work that God is trying to do in you. And in that restorative work, is, that's what speaks volumes to others about the power of God because they're seeing him in you. Matthew 7, 3 says this, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you have failed to notice the log in your eye? What God is trying to tell us here is that we should be more concerned about our own brokenness and that through dealing with our own log, we might encourage the people around us to deal with the speck in their eye. Another piece is apologize often. In an age of social networking, we've become far too concerned about being right. And I think that, that we have more people who have turned away from the faith, not because of hypocrisy, but because we haven't apologized for it. Because let's get honest, we've all been there. We've all done or said something stupid. In fact, just the other day, <laughs> I'm, I'm driving and who knows, I'm probably thinking about who knows what. I'm not... I'm not given 100% attention to my driving. And I did something uh, fairly rude, and it, and it made a, a, another driver very angry with me. And praise the Lord, I just happened to be in a, in a, in a great place. And she drives by me, and she looks at me, and I'm not going to describe the look because I think you know what I'm talking about. The look was not very happy. And so what I did is I smiled really big and I just mouthed the words, I'm sorry. And she, I, I, I wish, man, the, the change in her expression, even though it was just a split second, it was, it was beautiful. It was like she went from being, it's hard to be angry at somebody who's apologizing to you. It was, it was just kind of amazing. I, I think the power of a genuine apology shows the evidence of God's humility in us. Another thing that we can do is recline with sinners. This is what Jesus did. I love that in the Bible it says that Jesus reclined with them. And I, I don't know about you, but when I hear that word recline, it means I'm not in a hurry. I'm going to be here for a while. When I get in a recliner... I'm most likely going to end up taking a nap. <laughs> Jesus had only three years to change the world. If anybody didn't have enough time, it was him. Yet it was important enough for him to just be present. This means that we need to be patient and long-suffering with evangelism. You know, the funny thing about making investments is that we don't know when or if they will pay off. And that's not our job. Our job is to be present. Our job is to invest in people, to listen and help remind people that they matter regardless of their past. There's a piece of this that I think is really important, something that Jesus did and something that I think we often get wrong in church. Sometimes in church we want people to believe and then we want people to behave. And then when you believe and then when you behave, then you can belong. You can be a part of who we are. But Jesus did the opposite. Jesus said, I'm going to give you a place where you belong. And then here, close to my heart, you'll begin to believe. And as you begin to believe, you'll begin to behave. What would it look like for us to do that? The next piece is just live with intention. Look, pray for opportunities, ways to love and mentor people. Like what, what would it look like if we set goals for evangelism? If we set goals to meet new people, goals to ask bold questions, goals to tell what, what Jesus has done for us, 
Goals to take time to hear other people's stories. Goals to make a plan for evangelism. Goals to, to set time aside for other people. To take time to talk how, how you might positively influence people in your lives. I want you to think about this. That this, this whole piece of com companionship is how can we use our friendliness, how can we use our friendship and our love to communicate and show Jesus in and through us. Let me give you one more piece of this, and this is introduce the next generation to Jesus. When I was in Pennsylvania, I, I got an opportunity and started coaching girls basketball. In fact, I was wearing my old uh, sweatshirt the other day, and it has Coach Will on the back, and Malin read it, and she was like, you were a coach? I was like, thanks, Malin. Yes. Yes, I was. But don't get me wrong, I, 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 loved, I loved basketball, but that was all very intentional. As a youth pastor, I, I was looking for a way into the school, a way in to build relationships with students that weren't necessarily a part of my church. It was kind of, for me, a less awkward way to make youth group easier to attend because it wasn't just, we're going to hear Pastor Will, we're going to hear Coach Will. Now, I was going to stand outside and offer candy, but I was told that would be weird, so I, I didn't do that. <laughs> but basically, I, I wanted to use coaching as, as an opportunity to, to build relationships. And I think in a similar way, God's asking us to, to leverage our influence for his kingdom, almost like a way to let Jesus introduce himself to other people in your life, to the lost in your life. And I, I get, I don't know, I'm overly sensitive about this kind of stuff. I, I understand that sometimes when you talk about leveraging influence, it can sound a little bit cultish. But I just want to clarify, we're, we're not attempting to force our beliefs on anybody. We're not looking to manipulate, we're looking to cultivate. We're simply looking for ways to clear the path to Jesus. Let me read a scripture to you. This is Isaiah 62, 10. It says, go through, go through the gates, prepare a way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, and lift a signal over the peoples. We want to do our best to, to put other people in a position where they can experience God for themselves so that they might begin to foster a faith that is personal. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is who do we have influence over? Who in our lives can we clear the path of stones? Who in our lives can we plant and water seeds? And when I'm, I'm, I'm looking through this, I, I couldn't help and wonder, but who do we have more influence over than our children? And I mean all children, grandchildren, adopted children, school children, church children. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, Train up a child in the way and he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But can I just pause for a second and, and, and can we focus on the word train? This is a task of the home. This is the task and job of the spiritual leader. Are you cultivating an atmosphere in your homes where spiritual growth can occur? And if you're not training your children in the faith, who is? You know, it's, it's, it's crazy to me. and we, we send our kids to school we send our kids to, to sports camps, and those are great things. We put so much focus into training their, their mind and their bodies, but what about training their spirits? What about training in the ways of the Lord? What about training their souls to know and to love and to seek after Jesus? How do we train our kids to do that? How many of us, we, we kind of hope that the church will do this because we don't feel equipped to do it? Man. What's that say about us? It's not a shame thing. It says about us, maybe we need to train too. And maybe we need to train our kids along with us. That's the best part of teaching. It, it challenges us and helps us grow too. This is why I love preaching because every Sunday I get up here and preach to you. It's because God's been teaching me all week. If you think I'm prepared to get up here and do this through my own power, my own knowledge, and my own intelligence, woo, you have not met me yet. But every week is an opportunity for me to dig deeper in Scripture and just to reveal what God is saying to me. That you have the opportunity to do that in your homes. And can I just be, let's get real. Children appreciate honesty. 
And, and they know when we're not being real. Be honest about your doubt. Seek Jesus together. Let them see your heart as you continue to seek Jesus, as, as we try to figure it out. It's important to train them. Not, not just to do these with them, but to teach them how. I'm, I'm so thankful that I had a dad who every morning I woke up, I saw him reading his Bible. But I needed somebody else in my life to teach me how to read the Bible. It's part of the reason I'm teaching the class that I'm doing. So what, what are some of these things? What are some of these things that we need to do with them, teach with them? One of them is read the Bible. Another one is pray. And it goes back to the, the same idea I talked about. One of the things that I've really been challenged lately, I'm not talking about I've been a good dad this whole time. I'm talking about one of the things lately I've been doing is, is, is with Malin. I was like, you know what? I always pray over you every night. I need, I need to see if she can pray. I need to start asking her to pray for one thing. Because I don't want to just, I just don't want to develop a, a daughter who knows it's important to pray. I want to develop a daughter who knows how to do it. What about serving? What would it look like for you to, to serve and for your kids to see that you care about others? What, what would it look like to find opportunities to serve together? What if you drove around town with sandwiches and water looking for homeless people? What about giving? What would it look like to let your children see you give? Maybe to put the offering in the box for you or maybe to click the button when you give online to tell them why we give. This one's going to be hard, guys. What would it look like to take a Sabbath? To show our kids it's important to develop rhythms of rest. In a world of constant pressure to perform, what could be more important than teaching our kids to find rhythms of self-care? And maybe you're sitting there today and you're like, Pastor Will, this sounds real great, but this is sounding a whole lot like discipleship and not evangelism. And, and yeah, yeah, partly it does because they go hand in hand. And honestly, if, if you want to get into it with me, I think that they're one and the same thing. The Great Commission doesn't just call us to baptize. It calls us to make disciples. And let's get honest for a hot second. 60% of our students are leaving the church in college. And I cannot think of a more powerful evangelical movement than finding a way to keep them. We've got to find better ways to train up the next generation. Better ways to get them involved in what we're doing. Better ways to point them to Jesus. Better ways of, of, of living a life of clearing the stones from their path. I'm going to invite Charlie back up. I want to close with this thought. The world has changed. In a world of mass and misinformation, there is coming up a generation of people who are skeptical. Skeptical of faith, of leadership, of anybody in power making decisions. We are, are witnessing a generation of Thomases. A generation of people who are saying, unless I can touch the hands and feet of Jesus, I will not believe. And we will not win this war online arguing with people about Jesus. Guys, it's time for us to walk the walk. It's time for us to preach the gospel at all times and to use words when necessary. God sent us his spirit so that he might be found here on earth in and through us. Our wise and, and gentle words. In scripture, Jesus says something very, very important. He says, if in this world, as you're looking around and you're trying to find somebody who's a believer, there's one distinguishing thing that you can look for. You will find the people who know me by the way in which they love. The way that they love each other. That's a whole sermon right there. The way that we love our kids. The way that we love the lost. The way that we love our enemies. The way that we love even when it's hard to love. 
because that power is not completely in us. What does Scripture say? It says we love because He did what? Because He loved us first. That's the challenge today. Now the altars are open, and, and I know that part of the altars is a place for finding strength. Maybe there's some of you here today that need to come to the altar because of something completely different. But I would challenge you this way. Whether you come to the altar or not, as you sit there, as we sing, to think about that one person. Who in your life desperately needs the influence of Jesus through your influence. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? led to say this. I, I know that this is somewhat of a hard piece, and I, I, just, I just think about, as, as a parent, I, I get the struggle, and I know that you can be the most perfect parent, and you can do everything right, and your kid can still walk away. And I know that that breaks our hearts so much. And, and this today, and, and this to me, it's, it's about encouraging us to, to maybe see things in a different way, to maybe look and see for opportunities. But it's, it's not about the opportunities that you've missed. I think about all the opportunities that, that I've missed, opportunities that, that God slapped me in the face and I still missed them. It's not about dwelling on that, but it's about looking forward to tomorrow looking forward to later today after I take a nap, thinking about what, who, who in my life do I have influence on? Who needs that text message? Who needs that phone call? And maybe today you just want to come to the altars and, and maybe you have a son or daughter that's walked away from the Lord. And maybe you want to come and pray for them. Don't miss the opportunity to respond to Jesus today. So oh. 
Church, you ready? You're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, to you are. I love I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat for just a moment. Man, you ever just feel like the message is talking right to you? I don't necessarily think Pastor Will wrote that just for me, but I think God was speaking right to me during, during that. And um, I feel challenged, and, and, and I hope you do too. Um, we, we've got a couple of announcements for you. Pastor Will mentioned the invite cards in your worship folder, and those are great to pass out to somebody. That sermon series actually ends on uh, Easter Sunday, April 17th. So that's coming up. And so speaking of Easter, um, we got a couple of things we could really use your help with. Um, first off, uh, the kids are doing something for Easter with an Easter egg hunt, and we would love it if y'all could bring in some, some good candy for them that we could, we could share. There's going to be a box next week at the Welcome Center. And, and I'll, like, think about what you want the egg when you open the egg, what, what's in it that, that you want? Not, not the stuff you're going to throw away, the good stuff. Um, like some, those like eggs that, the Reese ones that look like eggs. I might do the, I might do the hunt. Um, and if you're like, man, I got so much going on this week, I don't have time. Like, I'm on spring break because I'm a teacher this week. And if you just like give me a few bucks, I promise I'll go, I'll go do your shopping for you. And I'll, I'll get the good candy. Um, second thing we could use your help on is uh, if you have any passion or any interest in singing, we would love for you to help us out with the choir um, on Easter Sunday. We're going to start practicing for Easter this coming Wednesday right here in the sanctuary over here on this side. Um, 6.30 to 7.30, we, we're going to do two choir songs for Easter Sunday. And if you're like, hey, I can do that. I can do one Sunday. Um, come join us this Wednesday. We'll pass out the music. We'll teach you how to sing everything. It'll be a really good time, and we would love for you to join us the next couple weeks practicing, getting ready for that. Um, last thing I want to remind you about is um, I think there was an announcement for it in the slides. Uh, next week, I think we're going to start the um, prayer and fasting, and there's actually a sign-up sheet for that. Um, you're not really signing up to do anything or to come to anything. You're just signing up as a commitment, saying, I'm going to do this. And then there's some resources out at the Welcome Center um, just some papers. It's really just kind of the self-guided um, season of prayer and fasting as we get into the um, season of Easter. And I actually think there's a sign-up sheet for the choir out there, too. So you can, you want to put your phone number down, I'll give you a call and, and we'll talk about it. Or if you just see me out in the lobby afterwards, we can, we can talk about it. But um, we are excited that you're here today and we hope you guys have a great week. I think the weather's starting to get more spring-like. That always makes me happy. So let's stand and I'll pray for us as we go out. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the challenging message that, that you have given Pastor Will that has fallen on so many of our hearts, Father. And I pray that you, would, um, you wouldn't just stop it here, Father, that, that you would take us out into this week, God, that you would go before us and that you, you would make a way for us to, to, to disciple, Father, to love and, and to just be a, a beacon of light through Jesus Christ, your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go in goodness.
Yeah. 